All right. Looks like we're ready to go. Uh, good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, we're getting ready to start something new in this class. So thanks for all of you who have, uh, who have helped me as we waded through uh, Israel all the way to Canaan. Uh, we are going to do something a bit different, and we're going to do something a bit different this morning than what we have been doing. Okay? There's no panic. It's okay. Uh, it'll be all right. Um, one of the things, one of the kind of one of the challenges, I think, of of uh, of the, this space, even, and even especially when we add in the online portion of the class, is making this more interactive, or where it just I don't want it just to turn into where you know I I, I really feel for you if if you just have to sit there and listen to me the whole time. So I'm trying to think of ways to make this a little more interactive and to change things up a little bit. We are going to do something different this morning, uh, just to begin with, for the first few minutes. It's something we've done. It's been a couple of years since we've done it. But I know that every, this is going to be, you guys, just hold your enthusiasm for just a second. We're going to learn a song this morning. Right? We're going to sing to open this, and we're going to learn this song. It's, uh, it's one that's really going to kind of launch us into what we're going to be talking about lesson-wise, but it's also, uh, it's also just a really good song and one I think that we, need to, that we need to know. So what we're going to do is, the very first thing is that we're just going to listen to it. The notes, the music will be on the screen. We're going to listen to it. Uh, this is done by the uh, Praise and Harmony group. We're going to listen to them sing it. After that, we're going we're to listen to it again. This time we're going to turn it down a little bit, and we're going to sing with it. And then the, the, the final time, um, Matt is going to get up here and lead it with, without them. Okay? And we're just going to learn. We're just going to wade our way through this. So you all ready? Here we go. Build your 
All right, we got it. All right, we're going to we're going to sing along with it this time. Is this on? Okay, so here's the deal. I'm not as good a song leader as this is. So if I screw up, I didn't screw up. Y'all just keep singing. Act like it never happened, okay? okay. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Yeah. 
Anybody feel a little uncomfortable? Right? Do we, do we go, well, this is different. Hold on. Right? It's okay. Right? That's all right. So what I want us to do is a couple things, and, and just this song to kind of, uh, and, and the way we've done this, to kind of launch us into where we're headed. Uh, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Our main text, the, the main voice we're going to hear through this next little section of lessons on Sunday or our Sunday morning class is going to be Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. But I, I really like to, to uh, introduce the lesson this way for a number of reasons. The first one is that I, I notice that we learn things, we seem to learn things well when we sing them. Okay? Um, we talked about this, I think, at the end of Deuteronomy. There's another place, Exodus chapter 15 where God says, or Deuteronomy anyway, he tells Moses, write this song, teach it to Israel. Right? Because they're going to sing this, and they're going to remember things from this. There's a message in that song that they're supposed to remember. Uh, I was, was reading a guy, I can't remember his name, but I was uh, reading a guy who uh, did his graduate work at a, at, a, at a Jewish university. And he talked about looking for a passage of Scripture, trying to remember where it was, and he went and spoke to one of his professors. And he said, I, I, I'm remembering this. This is kind of how this is phrased. And he said the professor kind of leaned back in his chair. He goes, and he closed his eyes, and he goes, and I could hear him humming. And then he said, here's where it is. And he goes, the reason I did that, he goes, because I had to mem I memorized the Torah, but I did it by song. So I know where everything is. It's one of those things that gets in us, and we remember it. We've talked about this before. Old commercial jingles, right? At great risk. Any Seinfeld fans, right? Costanza, right? By Menon, right? It, those things just stick with us, right? 
So we, we, we just remember those things. So that's, that's one of the reasons. The other one is, I want us to think about the way that we learned it. Right? How do we learn to sing that song? Well, we listened to it, and then we participated in it, and then we did it. Now, did we sing it perfectly? I'm looking around. I, I, if, if I see you nodding this way, I'm going to say where you did. And that's okay, right? It, it's all right. No, we didn't get it perfect. Now, if you and I, if this group of us, we came in here and we divided up and we got into our parts and we sang this and we sang this for, for the 45 minutes of class, we'd be pretty good by the time we were done. If we sang this every day, right, we would have this down. I want us to think about this whenever it comes to this idea of living what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. It's that we hear it, right? We hear it, and then we join along, and we kind of stumble through it, right? And we kind of we get, well, there was a sour note, right? But we keep, we keep going. But the more we do it, the better it becomes, right? The better it becomes. So what I want to do right now is I just want to kind of think through the song that we just heard, and just kind of set this all up, okay? So I just want to think through the words of this song for just a second. Come set your rule and reign. This is the kingdom of God, all right? Now, you may disagree with this, and that's okay, all right? It is. But I think that, that what we need to see about the kingdom of God is that it's a... a when he says, come set your rule... When they say, come set your rule and reign in our hearts again, that it is an already thing. The kingdom of God is already a thing, right? Think about, um, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, after the temptation. He comes out and it says that for that time he began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. In Luke he will say, the kingdom is among you. Yet there's also times when Jesus says, now, Here's what happens in the kingdom, or when the kingdom comes, or the kingdom of heaven is like. Those kinds of things are making us understand that maybe it's already, but not yet. Are you with me? Already, but not yet. The kingdom of God breaks in, but it is not, and I, 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 this is a risk, okay? When we say the kingdom of God is the church, yes, Right? And that God's established the church. Yes. But the kingdom, the full rule and reign of God is not yet. And if we don't believe that, all we have to do is look around. Right? Jesus teaches us to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I don't see it everywhere on earth as it is in heaven. It's an already, as we're moving in that direction, not yet complete. And I mean by mean complete, I mean what we see at the end of the story, at the end of uh, in the book of Revelation, when we are with God face to face, and all of the enemies of God are gone. Everything is, a, is, is right there. Are you with me? Right? You don't have to agree with this, but this is kind of what I'm, where, where we're kind of taking this, right? So set your rule and reign is what we're, what we're praying for God in, uh, in us. That what we do is under the control, under the lordship of Jesus. Okay? Um, increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. If they're my if they're favorite line in this song, it, this is one of them. Unveil why we're made. Um, it's been years ago that I heard uh, Randall Castleman ask the question, why doesn't God just take us right out of the baptistry and take us home? We're here for something. Now we can really go way back with this. In Genesis 1 and 2, humanity, Adam and Eve, are created as what? The image bearers of God. Right? Why are we made to be the image bearers of God? It gets a little more specific, maybe, or maybe even a little bit easier for us to wrap our minds around when we begin to start thinking about what we're, where we've just come with Israel. What's the purpose that God has for Israel? And there's a couple of places. One's in uh, Exodus chapter 7, 
Another one's in Exodus 14 around the crossing of the Red Sea where God tells Moses and, or tells Israel, this is what's going to happen so that the Egyptians know that I am God. This is the purpose of Israel, to introduce the rest of the world around them to God. Um, one of my favorite passages of all time is in Exodus chapter 19 when they get to the mountain. And God says that I have brought you here to be a kingdom of priests. Now if we think about that for just a minute, we say, hold on a minute, not everybody in Israel is a priest, right? Because if there were, then what's the whole book of Leviticus about? Right? D only the, the sons of Aaron are going to be priests. The sons of Aaron are going to be priests as they facil facilitate worship between Israel and God. All of Israel is going to function as a priest to be the people who introduce the other nations to God. Right? Are you with me? Uh, all, kinds of th all kinds of times within the law, he'll say, this is what they did, this is how they lived in Egypt, this is how they live in the land of Canaan, where you're going. You are not going to be that way, you're going to be different. So that everyone else knows who God is. Unveil why we're made. We have a purpose, right? To reflect the image of God, right? So we keep going, we keep going. I don't want to run out of time because it's a long song. Okay, um, come set our hearts ablaze with hope, wildfire in our very souls. Um, I don't know where this takes you as you think about that image. It, it takes me in a couple of places. Um, one is Paul writing to Timothy. He says, don't forget... Don't neglect this, but fan into flame the gift that you were given by the laying on of hands. Right? Fan into flame what you've been given. The other place that it takes me is Jeremiah. Where Jeremiah said, you told me to speak, God, and I didn't want to. But when I was silent, it was as if my very bones were on fire. Right? That there's something that moves within us. And we're asking God to fan that into flame. And maybe the most dangerous line in the song is next. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Uh, there's a couple of things as we think about uh, teachings that we find about the Holy Spirit, especially in the book of Acts, where we'll, there's a couple of different ways that we're talking about filled with the Spirit is talked about in Acts. Right? One would be, and he was filled with the Spirit, and this is what he did, right? Peter was filled with the Spirit, and this is how he spoke. Peter was filled with the Spirit, and he healed this person, or something in, in along those lines. But then there's other ways of saying, and Barnabas was a good man, full of the Spirit, and then we talk about his character, right? And he was encouragement, he was, he was generous, all of these things. I think, the, for me, maybe the, the frightening part of this of this prayer is the understanding of when the holy comes in contact with the unholy, judgment happens. Of everything else having to go. When God's presence invades the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 40, everything stops. And everything has to go out of there. When God's presence invades the temple, when Solomon dedicates it, all sacrifices stop, and everybody has to leave because the holy is there. And I think about areas of our life that need, probably need to be cleaned out, and we're asking for that to happen, and sometimes that's not going to be pleasant. Right? Okay, we keep going. Uh, we are your church. We're going to get to that one in a minute. Uh, then we have some real spe more specific Sermon on the Mount language. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. Then the other one, refuse to waste our lives. Right? Because God is, is what we're after. All right? Uh, to see the captive's heart released, the, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We think of, of, of uh, this language of laying down our life. 
And, and we think of the language that Jesus uses of saying, I, I lay down my life for my sheep, John chapter 10. Right? Or, or greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Those kind of things. And we think about this idea of, of laying down our lives. And, and maybe we wrestle with it. Would we be able to? Right? Would we be able to lay down our lives if it comes to it? Would we be able to, to give it up? And I think even more so than that, or maybe one that that's, I've neglected far too long, is of going that laying down our lives is something that's done a little at a time. In the little things, in the little ways, it's a daily habit of laying down our lives, putting our wants and our things aside for the good of others, laying those down. And we lay down our lives for the cause of heaven, which the cause of heaven is the reconciliation of God to humanity. Right? All right. Um, unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. Um, I don't think this, I, I, I would be shocked if most of us think this, but there is an idea um, that we have, we have God and we have Satan, and they are almost in, in some effect e- equal. Right? That good and evil, the, the battle rages, and they're on even footing, but they're not. Right? Nothing will stop God. Right? If we've peaked at the end of the book, God wins. Right? Nothing will stop God from being victorious. What will stop us from being victorious with Him is whether or not we decide to be with Him or not. Okay? But God, make no mistake, God will win. I think about it again from Jesus, and I think this is in John 10. I can't remember for sure, but I'm almost positive it is, where He says that these are mine and no one snatches them out of my hand. Right? That there's nothing, right? There's nothing that will keep us from God. That's Paul says that in, in, uh, in Romans. All right. Um, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. Here you go. And these are the, the, those kind of repeated ones. We are your church. Right? The first one is we need your power in us. Without God in the mix... We're not really a church. We're a group of people that meet for maybe for a common interest, but without God in the mix, you know, we have to have Him with us. We are the hope on earth. Paul, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, says that it is through the church, by the church, but with the church, that the wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God is declared. We are the hope on earth. When we think about hope that we have, the hope that... that that God has provided, I go, to, I go to Jesus, right? He is the hope to which we cling. Paul talks about this in one of his trials, I can't remember which one it is, but as he opens his, his, uh, his defense, he said, it's because of the hope of Israel that I am here before you today. Jesus, the hope of Israel. We think about this idea of kingdom. We think about this idea of God's people. We think about this idea of God's, uh, God's family. But the body of Jesus, the hope on earth, is the church. There are a lot of people, and, and all we have to do is listen. There are a lot of people who are looking for hope. Right? Right? And they're attaching themselves to whatever it is they believe that can, that, that can hold that hope. And I wonder if maybe it's kind of sad that maybe the last place they look is here, is to the church. Right? We're the hope. We're to communicate that hope. We're to live in that hope. 
Okay? So that's, gonna, that's kind of our launching pad for this. Like I said, what I wanted to talk about really was really from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we, we're going to go to different places, but that's going to be the, the, the main voice at the table is going to be Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we're going to have some other folks who are going to join in in the conversation with us. Uh, we're we're going to try to do, a, and I'm still working on some ways to make this a little more interactive, because there's going to be some times when we're going to need to visit with one another right during this time and talk about this. But there are going to be others that we're going to, that we're going to listen to, that we're going to hear, that have things to say about the Sermon on the Mount. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to lay it out there, just kind of the, some of the things that, that you're going to hear come from me and where they're going to come from. Uh, there's, a, there's a book, great book. Um, I haven't read it in a, in a while. I've got it. I'm starting back through it again. Uh, it's called The Good and Beautiful Life. Right? The Good and Beautiful Life, it's a, uh, and it is really an exposition on the Sermon on the Mount and ways in which we live that out. Um, another one that we're going to hear from, uh, and some of you have heard from him before on this subject. Some of you may even have the book, may have gone through uh, the classes, or may even be looking at it now. But uh, Randy Harris from Living Jesus. It's, it's a, he does a really good job of, of working his way through the Sermon on the Mount and, and talking about what it means to us. These are just some other voices that we're going to hear. Uh, another one is, uh, is Dallas Willard. And I don't know if anybody knows who Dallas Willard is, but I have yet to pick up a book that has anything to do with, uh, with spiritual formation, living in the kingdom, that does not reference Dallas Willard at some point. Uh, he is... Uh, He's incredibly wordy, but he has some good information. And so we're going to hear some from him. And then we're going to have some terminology that we're, I hope we're familiar with, but I don't want to throw anybody off, okay? And one of, those, uh, one of those things that we're going to talk about is some spiritual formation, okay? Uh, that may be a foreign uh, phrase to us, but, but here's basically what it is, is being transformed in the image of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is kind of the, the idea, Okay? Spiritual formation, which I think is what we see Jesus after in the sermon. That this is, who you, this is who he's talking to. This is what I want you to become on the other side of this as you live this out. Being formed in his image. The other one, uh, which may even make us more uneasy, uh, is uh, spiritual discipline. Now that doesn't mean that one of the elders is going to drag us out back and beat us with a Bible. Okay? That, that, that's not it. It's a practice, a practice that, uh, in which we engage to help move this along, okay? Some we're incredibly familiar with, we just don't call them that, right? We may just not think of them as, oh, well, that's a spiritual discipline. Worship is a spiritual discipline, right? To come here with other, other followers of Jesus, to be formed in His image, to wor wor look what it's like to walk in His steps together, is that's a discipline, and we know it's a discipline because we we get up and do it, right? There's something to be said about that of just doing it because we need to do it, right? And then that's that's a discipline. Another one is prayer, is is you know is a spiritual discipline. But there are others that are mentioned in Scripture that we may not be all that familiar with. We're going to talk about some, and and I listen. I, all I'm going to do is throw out ideas in these cases, and say, we might give this a shot, right? We might try this, and we might talk and see how it works, works its way out. This is not going to be, this is not going to be, okay, here's what, you know, here's what you're going to do, and here's the day you're going to do it, and I'm going to come and check on you and see if you've done it. No, we're just going to talk about these, the benefits of them, and then, and then maybe some opportunities to practice them on, on the way through, okay? We all good? All right, so that's kind of that's where we're headed, where we're going to start, uh, this morning is just by listening, by listening to what he has to say, and then there's a couple of comments at the end. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. When he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. 
Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem. For it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you will love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do this? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your acts of righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your father, so that your giving may be in secret, and your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. 
When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and, and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more, more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged. And with the same measure you use it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye where when there's a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits." Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 
The rain fell and the floods came, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowd was, was astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching as them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Let's pray as we're close. Father, we give you thanks today. We give you thanks for who you are, for the one who created us in your image, for the one who is the, the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth. Father, we're thankful and humbled that we can be part of your kingdom. And as we listen to the words of your son, help us to to not just hear them, but to live them. Father, help us as we navigate how to live these words of Jesus in the culture in which we find ourselves now. Help us to be a good reflection of who you are. Father, we, we want nothing more than to be your people. Help us to, to be a good reflection of you and to be formed in the image of your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.